y no José Cristo. Entonces, y hoy comienza así van a hacer las cosas. la vuelta al porvenir. ¿Qué es dónde? En el Pucumano. Ah, ok, 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 ok. Muy buenos días para todos, eh, bienvenidos a esta segunda mitad del curso, ya hemos alcanzado la primera mitad del curso de nanotecnología para la administración de fármacos herbales indígenas colombianos a cargo del profesor eh, Jazz Wampatak. Eh, profesor Jazz Wampatak, welcome again, thank you very much for your uh, lecture today, your seventh lecture, the first the second half of the course <laughs> and uh, we are very happy to have you here so go ahead gracias professor Stiller. uh Played our seventh lecture of the workshop and five more to go. Uh, I'm enjoying my stay in Colombia and one of my good friends from University of South Florida, Professor Willy Moreno, he said that once you come to Colombia, Colombia people don't let you go back to your home. <laughs> and I am experiencing that the love and wonderful weather and beautiful Colombia here in Bogota. Thank you very much. And today we are going to talk about back to square one, a passage towards precision medicine. And I will explain you why I'm calling it back to square one in my last slide. So all the figures are taken from various web sources. Just to explain the idea then concepts not to be used for sale or any other purpose except teaching. Uh, I have already shown you the beautiful pictures of Tampa, Florida and I bring the greetings from USF Tampa, Florida. Amo Colombia, Ila, Gente, De Aqui, Mi Nombre es Yashwan Patak, Actualmente estoy en EE in USA. Soy Profesor y decano asociado en la Universidad del Sur de Florida, Taneja College of Pharmacy. Yeah, sorry. No problem. Um, soy profesor y decano asociado en la Universidad del Sur de Florida, Taneja College of Pharmacy. Estoy en Colombia como becario Fulbright Specialist. Uh, yesterday, I was in National University in the campus and I used my Spanish expertise 
to talk to the people because they were knowing Pukito Pukito English and I was knowing Pukito Pukito Spanish. <laughs> but it worked very well and I could visit faculty of pharmacy and I met the director of the faculty of pharmacy who was very happy to talk to me and hope I will be able to visit them uh, next time. Uh, sincere thank to Unosida Distrital Francisco Jose de Caldas for hosting me as a Fulbright specialist here at Bogota. Believe it or not, today my taxi driver missed the road and I brought him to the <laughs> Distrital <laughs> University through all this one way <laughs> and he was thankful to me that oh I, I know the graph geography now of Santa Fe, very interesting. So my sincere thank to Rector and Dean and other administrative heads supporting my trip here. My sincere thank to Fulbright Specialist Commission of Colombia for supporting my trip to Bogota, Colombia. I will fail if I do not mention my sincere gratitude to our most handsome professor, <laughs> Cesar Aurelio Gerano Piero, being my host and incredible support for making my stay happy here. And special thanks to Reem Abdilohum and Shannon Fleming of World Learning, Sergio Villamil Sanchez, Sebastian Villamizar and many other Colombian Fulbright Commission for their kind support. Professor Luis H. Reyes, Juan C. Cruz, Willy Moreno, Luis Fernandez, Cruz Quirogo, all of them inspired me to come to Colombia. Special thanks to Professor Alexis Ortiz from International Office of UDFJDC and Alvaro Vasquez for encouraging me to apply for this Fulbright Specialist for Colombia and encouragement of all is supportive. So supportive outcome is I am here. Des de El Fonde. Fondo de mi corazón. Apologies for my Spanish pronunciation and if you understand my Spanish, then you will understand my English. Miss Disculpas for me as panel. So we have already seen this slide that pharmacies do much more than counting the pills and they are now improving their activities and it is now changing. Uh, there are headlines <coughs> where they say the doctor is not needed because pharmacists can take it a lot of things. And the <coughs> healthcare pharmacy is changing. And there is a let me get my water bottle. <coughs> there is a significant increase. There is a significant increase in the use of uh, iPhones and iPads and everything and all the gadgets. So the life and the whole uh, profession of healthcare is changing, whether it is nursing, physician, pharmacist or physician assistant. This is changing so fast and especially in coming few years, the artificial intelligence will also change a lot of things into the this area and we are looking at uh, seeing that the uh, pharmacy will be influenced and the healthcare will be influenced by the technology which is being adopted very fast and we may have different types of headlines I discussed this already so I won't want to spend time there so the challenges which are here are geriatric pharmacotherapy as I mentioned and we are going to have a special talk on uh, why there is a challenge for the human society about the older people and I have a very good talk which will be probably in another two days I will be talking about it. So geriatric pharmacotherapy is the forthcoming challenge for healthcare as well as pharmacy profession because the number of people are getting old and older and they are growing and that is where the challenge is coming. Another area which is very important for Precision and personalized medicine, which is the top topic of today's talk, is bioinformatics. And the unavoidable alternative for enormous data and its application may be basic tool for precision and personalized medicine. So bioinformatics is giving us so much of information that can be utilized to build up precision and personalized medicines. And we are going to talk about this. But bioinformatics is nothing but trying to understand retrieve the data and then find out how to analyze the data and how to interpret the data and how to use the data for the healthcare 
help and this is where the bioinformatics is going to be working uh, as a basic tool for precision and personalized medicine and bioinformatics is now a uh, growing um, field in the healthcare and with the cloud competing, computing now, the accessibility to the knowledge and information is growing. And you can sit in your home and you have access to all the databases around the world and you can utilize them and a lot of information is created which will be basic tool for precision and personalized medicine and that is where we are all looking for this system. Another thing which is uh, very important and changing the face of healthcare is pharmacogenomics and this is another area which is absolutely becoming a strong uh, actually strength for the precision and personalized medicine and we will see that and I already have discussed this that if you have a patient group uh, and if you provide the medicine to this patient group some patients will show drug toxicity but no benefit some patient will show uh, no toxicity and no benefit so it is useless to give the medicine to this group some people show drug toxicity but not beneficial again this group is you uh, should not get the medicine neither this group nor this group the only group which should get is drug non-toxic and beneficial so in this patient group we have to identify only these people who will be using the therapeutics using the drugs and this all based on genomic polymorphism how the genomics is playing and how the genetic structure is happening and how these people from different races do the pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics when the drug is uh, incorporated or given to the patient. So pharmacokinetics is nothing but the absorption, distribution, metabolism and excretion of the drug ADME that is what they use and ADME changes from race to race. Now people have understood that not all people have similar type of absorption or similar pattern of excretion similar pattern of distribution on metabolism. Same thing is pharmacodynamic factors where this is the interaction of your drug with the receptors, your ion channels, your enzymes and your immune system. And this again the pharmacodynamic factors also are changing. And this is becoming the basis of your precision and personalized medicine. So you do not want to give medicine to the whole patient group, but you want to find out what is the particular group which will need a precise medicine which is a personalized medicine for only this group based on the data which you receive from the pharmacogenomics and this is where the whole pattern of thinking is going on and gradually you will find in another 10 years this will work so mystery of the human body is very interesting so one of the enduring mysteries of medicine is how individual genes environment and lifestyle combined to spark disease or protect us from it. It is very, nowadays people are more focusing on preventive measures. So in preventive measures they are trying to learn that how individual genes which we borrow from our parents affect the disease, how the environment and the lifestyle, the epigenetics, what you eat also affects your disease condition and this is where People are now trying to understand the mysteries of the medicine. Is it how it works? Like many people are now eating a lot of probiotics because it is helping them to create their microbiota. The good microbiota makes it less disease in body. So now this is a very new thing which western world is understanding. But rest of the world was knowing it very well. Uh, but you know it is always like that. So you have a mystery of human body even the parents blood type A and mother might be blood type B but children can get either type A or type AB or type B or type O. So this is nobody now knows why the children get different blood group and why the parents have different blood group. So what combination how the genes play the role in these changes of blood group from one generation to other generation is a mystery. Nobody knows why it is happening and what genes are. So now people are trying to find out analyzing the genomic structure of children and the parents to find out what genes are really responsible for creating a specific blood group. 
and unraveling this puzzle remains essential for scientists hoping to achieve the elusive goal of offering tailored treatments and personalized prevention plans. Now, the first thing, personalized medicine or therapy, was transfusion of the blood. And transfusion of the blood is type blood A type A only can accept type A group. You cannot give him blood type B, he will die. Or type AB or type O, he will die. Even though the parents belong to A and B, the mother cannot give blood to type A group because it will be detrimental. Only father can give because father is type A and child son is type A. But if it is AB, then both of them cannot give blood to AB. Not possible. So this is how the genetical structure and this personalized medicine is decided. So people, the first thing which people have learned is that only type A will go to type A. Type AB will go to type AB. This was personalized medicine. You cannot exchange. And that is what we have to learn. And until recently, this remained at best a far distant dream. And in recent pandemic, we were more puzzled with these mysteries. Because in pandemic, we have seen that in one family, only one person got COVID. Even though the person was in family, rest of the family don't. Why? We don't know. And you, some people were there, they will walk around without mask, without anything, never got COVID. But some people stayed at home and got COVID. They never went out, used all the precaution, but got COVID. Now this is a mystery, why this is happening? And why, what is, what are the reasons? So the pandemic has created enormous area of research to understand the mysteries of human body and mysteries of humanity at large. So what is precision medicine? Is according to the precision medicine initiative, precision medicine is an emerging approach for disease treatment and prevention that takes into account individual variability in genes, environment and lifestyle for each person. Now we have already talked about it that genes, environment and lifestyle really make you. If you are a, you have healthy habits right from the beginning, you live longer. But that is not true because there is a very nice joke. There was a big Hollywood uh, actor. He was 93 years old. So he gave an interview on TV. So the TV interview said, what is the success of your being such a long life, 93 years old? So he said, my success is that I drink at least two pegs of whiskey every day. And I smoke at least 10 cigars every day. And then I eat all the sweets and everything, all bad things. That's secret of my life. So he said, what about your doctor? He never advised you not to do all these things. So he said, my doctor is resting in peace. When he was 70 <laughs> years old, he died. So it is very difficult to know. So you have extreme needs. There are people who are 90 years old, 95 years old, smoke 10 cigarettes every day, no cancer. There are young people who smoke few cigarettes every day and at 35 years die of cancer. Now what is the reason? We don't know. This is the mystery. And this is where, now if you give the same medicine to a 35 year old and 95 year old, it will not work. So obviously you have to find out a way to treat the person based on his genetic structure, based on his environmental thing, based on his lifestyle. If somebody is really healthy, he doesn't need medicines. Because there are, I have discussed that view zone area, like in Japan, there are people who always live 100, 110 years old, but they are very healthy. They eat everything, their food habit, their thing, genes. In, on an average in, in America, it is observed that the white people, Caucasian gene, are very strong. So they live longer in spite of drinking, all bad habits, mm -hmm. they still live longer. The Asian people don't, they die early because of genetic structure. So it is all, and secondly, the environment also, what type of environment. But overall period, if you see the history of humanity, in last hundred years, the lifespan is growing. That means we are, the epigenetics is playing a well role. And the medical science is also helping us to live longer and longer and longer. So, 
This precision medicine will allow the doctors and researchers to predict accurately what treatment and preventive strategies for a particular disease will work in which groups of people. So nowadays they are saying that if your parents have diabetes and if you are going to get diabetes, then you better walk at least 10,000 steps every day. And that will reduce your diabetic thing. Like that, there are many different parameters now that people are building it up, which will be very helpful to tell you that, you know, do this, take this medicine, but do all these environmental factors, do all these epigenetic factors, and do this, 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 it will help you. So, complementing the uh, medicine. So, it is in contrast to one size fits all approach. Till now, the pharmaceutical industry said one size fits all, one tablet to everybody. Doesn't matter who is, what is background. In which disease treatment and prevention strategies are developed for average person and with less consideration for the differences between the individuals. Like for me, no problem. <laughs> okay, okay. No, you complete. <laughs> no problem. Okay. So, one size fits all will not work nowadays in new generations. We are now understanding that it doesn't work. And that's why people are looking at alternatives. And precision medicine, as I mentioned, the term precision medicine is relatively new. But the concept of has been part of the healthcare for many years, like blood groups. Every blood A group will get only A group. B will get only B group. So this was the precision medicine concept, which was adopted by the people in uh, healthcare. But now we are going further to find out what kind of Several areas of medicine and role of precision medicine in day-to-day healthcare is relatively limited. We don't know yet, but it is growing. So I am going to give share with you a lot of new areas what is happening. So precision medicine is an approach to patient care that allows doctors to select treatment that are most likely to help patients based on the genetic understanding of their disease and this may also be called personalized medicines. The difference here is that precision medicine seeks to create treatment that are applicable to groups of individuals who meet certain characteristics and this is different from personalized medicine. So there is a difference between precision medicine and personalized medicine which implies individualized treatment available for every unique patient. So precision medicine is for a group of patients while personalized medicine is for individual patient. And healthcare is rapidly moving towards a precision medicine which offers a deeper understanding of human physiology using genetic insights and advances in technology. So now you will find here, this is precision and personalized medicine to understand the techno why, why it is. So patient A, suppose you get a drug here, what it will create is that drug will mutate the DNA and then you will find a drug A inside and then malignant cell growth is prevented. Now, in case of patient B, the mutation may happen on the other side of the DNA and then you may get a different gene structure and which may also help it. So, this is where personalized medicine, this is a typical precision medicine where a general group of people will show exactly the mutation happening in DNA and common for all of them. In this case, it is a precision uh, mutation B where only Specific persons will show this type of thing and that is what the difference between the personalized medicine and precision medicine is there. So understanding the development of precision medicine and personalized medicine is interesting. So this was our first empirical way of giving the drug. So one size fits all medicine to so everybody irrespective of who they are, what is their pharmacokinetic property, what is their pharmacodynamic property, what is their genetic structure, what is their environment in which they are growing or their lifestyle. We were giving one size fits all. Then we started moving to the stratification. So patients are grouped by disease, subtypes and demographics and clinical features and biomarkers. So nowadays what is happening is people are trying to understand like diabetes is diabetes, correct? But 
increase in sugar doesn't mean that your pancreas are not working. Your pancreas are doing, but your epigenetics or your food habits are different. And that's why you see high sugar. And some people don't see that sugar. So, diabetes can be of many different types in many different people. So, you may have to attack a receptor which may allow the sugar from your blood to go through urine. So, there is a medicine called Jardinis. Now, Jardinis is a medicine which affects the receptors which makes you to go to urine frequently. Like I am taking Jardinis now for myself. So, every two hours I have to rush to the toilet. If I don't go, then that medicine allows me to remove the glucose through the urine. Now there is another receptor which tries to reduce the concentration of glucagon in the body circulation, which will stop the insulin release because higher the glucagon, insulin is released more. And this is where the drug will say that glucagon goes down. Insulin release is less, pancreas is protected. There is another drug, glimepride, and then there is the Januvia. So, they are now understanding that one drug type diabetes to all will not work because diabetes is caused by many different receptors, many different ways in the body. Same thing happens with cardiovascular diseases. In cardiovascular diseases, certain people eat simple food but they have a lot of blockage. Some people eat a lot of fat, a lot of everything, no blockage. And we don't understand. There are certain young people nowadays that at the age of 45, they die of heart attack. They have no blockage. They have no cardiac history. They, have, they were very healthy, but died of heart attack. I have a, my, one of my relatives, they were traveling in the train. In India, trains are big thing. And he was showing that, oh, that's the fold. And he showed the hand like that. And that hand fell down. And he died. On spot. And just one week before, he had all his medical annual evaluation was done. And he was considered to be most healthy people. There is no reason why he died. As on today. And this happens with cardiovascular uh, health also. Same thing happened with your kidney failure. Same thing happens with your lung failure. You know, there are millions of people who smoke a lot, but still their lungs are healthy. Yeah. There are very few people who get the passive smoke and get lung cancer. It is so common that uh, you smoke a lot, especially they have found out that if the women drink a lot of alcohol during the pregnancy, it affects the fetus. If the women have high blood pressure during the pregnancy, the fetus has diseases. Now, this is what genetics and we don't understand now. This is all mysteries of the human life. We don't understand. And this is where people are trying to find out why does it happens. And then now they, so what is happening is if you see now, there is an awareness. So I, in America, I have seen many of my colleagues who are female, once they become pregnant, from that day onward, once they know that they are pregnant, they stop drinking coke, they stop drinking coffee, they stop drinking alcohol, they stop smoking, because now they know that if you do all these things, who is going to suffer? The baby is going to suffer, because that is how these things happen. And that's why nowadays, because of this knowledge, we are learning a lot. And this is where uh, the, uh, this is going to change the healthcare because the people are more interested in preventive measures rather than treatment measures. So there is a Hollywood actress, I think I am forgetting her name, but she removed her breast because her mother died of breast cancer. So she said, I don't want breast cancer. So let it be because I may be beautiful. I always used to make a joke. I teach drug delivery systems and polymers and all those things. So I used to make a joke. Joke in the sense, it's a reality. But I used to say that you want to be very beautiful with very big breast and all those things with lot of implants 
and then after 10 years you die of breast cancer because those implants can cause cancer and this is where nowadays they are very worried about using the silicon implants and polyurethane implants because that can cause cancer so now you have an option to remain beautiful for 10 years and die of breast cancer or remain simple normal human being and live longer choice is yours and that is applicable to you males also because males also use many different types of hormones these that and all the things lead to death but be a human natural human god given body and protect it you are better and this is where these things are happening so now from stratification separating this group into different groups who are responding to the different types of diseases different ways of receptors uh, techniques and finally coming down to the personalization where now you will have a patient individual you will identify what receptor is responsible for a particular diabetic high sugar and treating him with that particular drug not necessarily so this is a group of patient with all different colors then you stratify them into different groups so each of this group will need different medicine based on their genetic structure based on their environment and their lifestyle and then you identify out of this each group you identify a person who needs very specific medicine and that is called precision medicine and then this all this brown group will come to one group and then they will get the medicine so like here personalized and individual medicine so a general cancer vaccine is there so you are giving it to everybody but your brown guy is separate so you get into stratified medicine now you have four brown guys here so now you are identifying four out of that big group which are relatively responsible to get this medicine and then empirical medicine where all blues are getting yeah. them so you move from empirical medicine to stratified medicine to personalized medicine so it starts where you give one size fits all then you identify who are the browns here and pick up only one brown out of that and this is called the um, personalized and precision medicine now here you this all depends upon what you are giving to the patient so if it's a cancer patient you provide vaccines you provide transzumafab which is the anti antibodies based imatinib nsaid all different types of medicines are there now you are giving everything to the blue guys and then ultimately you create only a brown guy get the cancer vaccine not all people will get care. this is how the stratified and uh, personalized medicine is changing so precision medicine is now a very used widely exclusively more on cancer patient because you know in good old days we used to say that a person is suffering from cancer then we realized that cancer is not simply cancer cancer has 100 different types of cancers correct initially we didn't know that now we know everything now they are identifying that what genes cause the cancer now every person will have different genes and that's where now your drug need not be the same for all the cancer patient who are suffering from liver cancer or lung cancer because the genes are different and that is where your use of personalized medicine and precision medicine is more useful in cancer because you don't have to treat the cancer patient with the same chemotherapy doses with the same radiation with the same poisonous anti cancer drug you don't have to do it and that is why you will find that in cancer treatment nowadays the things are changing i remember in 10 years back if you see a, if you walk on the road you will find who is suffering from cancer no hair very weak very uh, you know liable for immune reaction and susceptible for diseases another disease mm -hmm. normally cancer patient used to die of pneumonia because the immune immu immunity gone so down that they will not die of cancer but die of pneumonia like our uh, covid in covid patient lot of patients in america i don't know how it happened in colombia but in america those patients who went on ventilator died much earlier because the covid was growing the virus was growing in the body multiplying and they were putting ventilator so there was no fresh thing to the body 
and died in you know normally they put ventilator third day death but again the mystery was i had my relative who was on ventilator for 21 days he had a high covid and he survived he survived so unfortunate but he survived and then he had little bit of covid complications and after 6 months he just walked into the taxi to go to the hospital but by the time taxi reached the hospital he died and that was the covid after effect after 6 months so he survived with 21 days of ventilator but died walking into the taxi with all his files and everything but didn't reach the hospital and in india it is very interesting if you die on the road your body has to go undergo post mortem because hospital don't accept it so it has to go to the government hospital then they post mortem and then they give the body so after four days they got the body back so this cancer treatment is precision medicine include gene therapy and gene editing technology we talked about it yesterday a little bit is rapidly advancing across the health landscape and it is reflected in growing research community and expanding market and increased public awareness and acceptance of gene editing technology so now people are understanding yesterday i have shown in the picture that gene have certain amino acids which are causing cancer or growth of cancer cell so you clip them or you deactivate them and you can treat the cancer and gene therapy replaces the faulty gene if there is a faulty gene with a amino acid section sequence which is causing that is a fault in the gene you remove it or you deactivate it or add the new gene in an attempt to cure the disease so new gene will break this enhance this deactivation and the faulty gene will not uh, multiply and uh, or cure disease or improve your body's ability to fight disease so gene therapy holds promise for treating a wide range of diseases such as cancer cystic fibrosis heart disease diabetes hemophilia and aids now try to understand we had talked about chronic diseases in our first lecture all of these are chronic diseases and this is where the gene therapy will be very useful for chronic diseases not for the acute diseases and you will yesterday we talked about it but i'll repeat this again that there is a in vivo gene therapy so what you do is you use non viral drug delivery system like liposomes or dendrimers or anything and transfer the gene from outside to human body and try to manipulate the genes in the body that is one way of doing it second way of doing is which is widely used now is called viral delivery so adenovirus or lentivirus you use those viruses and incorporate the gene in the viruses viruses got into your body and treat the disease or change the genetic structure the other way is ex vivo gene therapy now ex vivo gene therapy is a personalized medicine in vivo gene therapy is a precision medicine so you use drug delivery system put the genes and give it to a group of people correct that is precision medicine but when it come to personalized medicine what you do is you take the stem cells from a person like they will take my blood now they take my blood they cultivate it they manipulate my genes and then inject back to me this is personalized medicine my stem cells will not be injected to professor caesar or to you or to her because it will not work you follow so difference between personalized medicine and precision medicine is personalized medicine is ex vivo gene therapy where you take the genes from a human being manipulate the genes make sure that it works very well it destroys the faulty genes in your body and they are injected back into the same person they cannot be injected to other person and that is the personalized medicine precision medicine is you put the gene into drug delivery system like liposome and inject it to a group of people doesn't matter because that is where you are finding out the brown people group of brown people. viral system so this is very important to understand the difference between precision medicine and personal medicine so in cancer treatment if you have if somebody is suffering from lung cancer what they will do is they will take their blood out then they will take their stem cells out then they will identify the genes who are present there or they will identify what gene is really causing the cancer and then they will try to 
deactivate that particular portion of the gene and then put back. Now once it is put back, the deactivated gene will multiply and will not allow the cancer gene to grow. And that's how you will control the cancer growth in the lung or liver. Sounds good? It's, is it logical or it is? Am I okay with that? Yeah. So this is how the personalized medicine and cancer treatments are very popular. So cancer types which have been targeted with gene therapy include brain cancer, lung cancer, breast cancer, pancreatic cancer, liver cancer, colorectal cancer, prostate cancer, bladder cancer, head cancer, neck, skin, ovarian, renal cancer, all different types of cancer, you will have to have different types of technology. You cannot use, but it's coming. Uh, that's a question, but... Oh, go ahead. Please. She's referring to the case of metastasis in the cancer. The, there is the same treatment for the this, this kind of personalized uh, yeah. treatment. Yeah. So the metastasis can be protected, prevented. Another, uh, any change in the treatment? Or? You know, the there are two different types of cancers. One of these is metastasis. Some cancers do not grow as fast as other cancers. Like if you have a prostate cancer, you can live with prostate cancer for 20-30 years. And many a times I have seen people who got operated died in two months. Because during the operation, what went wrong they don't know. But the one person who was living for, with metastatic prostate cancer, the growth was slow. So, for every cancer, the growth is dependent upon individual genes, individual environment and individual lifestyle. So even though we call it metastasis, it is all dependent upon not the same cancer will grow at the same speed in every person. So there are some people, uh, we have, and there are a lot of papers on that, that uh, women suffering from breast cancer, they remove the breast and they live for 20 years. Some women, even though the breast cancer, breast is removed, no tumor, die very quickly in six months. We don't understand why. Because gene, lifestyle, environment, other factors also are playing role. In case of treating the cancer, suppose you see that your cancer is not growing as fast, then you may use the genetic structure quickly to remove the cancer and it may help. But if it is growing metastasis, then you have to create a gene which will deactivate the genes which are causing metastasis. So you are trying to control the growth of genes in the tumor which causes the growth of gene or cancer cells. And that can be clipped or that can be deactivated and then you uh, control the metastasis, you control the growth of the tumors and this is where both cancers are now they are trying to treat with genetic therapy, immunotherapy, where if it is growing then you immediately try to find out the gene which is causing and try to clip it, try to deactivate it so that the growth, further growth will be restricted, you stop the further growth. So you will carry the cancer but it will not grow, so you will live a little longer. But if you cannot do that, if you don't identify the right gene and all those things, then there is, so it is still in experimental stage. You know, there is not only one gene. They, there is a uh, lot of disc discrepancy. Some people say that there are more than 10,000 genes, there are 39,000 genes, some people say 100,000 genes. So we know, don't know, we are learning about that. But which gene will cause this cancer or metastasis, we don't know. That's how they... Personalized medicine is you take the stem cells, they find out, they do, uh, they take 100 plates, put everything and then find out which works. And that's how they clip the gene. And it takes time, you know, it is still in experimental. Normally, the early stage of cancer, they are treated with radiation therapy, chemotherapy and all the things. This is, they are experimenting on the last phase of cancer where they want to learn. And that is how it is happening. Am I, did I answer your Thanks. You are okay with that. 
So gene therapy involves the transfer of genetic material. You create a trans genetic material which is modified and send it in your body. Usually in a carrier or a vector, either it can be a virus vector or it can be a non polymeric vector, non virus vector and the uptake of gene into the appropriate cells of the body. Cell therapy involves the transfer of cells with the relevant function to the patient. So you provide a modified genetic system into the body which will get into your tumor and in, interact with the cells of the cancer which cause proliferation. So you prevent the proliferation and that is where the cancer treatment happens with the gene therapy. So you have different types of you know this caption shows you that you know intro interrogatory application so you start investigating what is good then you find not affecting gene expression or affecting uh, epigenetic gene expression then come to transient gene activation and transient gene silencing so you try to do either deactivation or silencing some of other ways you will do that and this is where uh, you are uh, now, if you remember yesterday's structure, we tried to find out siRNA and mRNA. mRNA is a long stride. This is your mRNAs which are connected with siRNA. Now they will modify the genetic structure. And that is how they are incorporated. Or there is another possibility that from interrogatory applications, you go to genomic modification, modulation, uh, kenosine, knockout, knocking out or knockout mm -hmm. and then come to therapeutic application and then come to drug development, put it in polymers and then inject those modified genes there. Or disease modeling and then try to do use research and development to find out how it can be utilized. And this is how the whole process of precision medicine is going on using this uh, siRNA, mRNA and different types of RSIC and RNAi. Most of the mistakes. Yes. Is that okay? Yeah. Good. So, precision medicine and cancer treatment is another cancer transfer is a new treatment. Gene transfer to the cancer patient is a new treatment. This is like not even 10 years old and still in experimental stages. We will see only one method is approved by FDA in America. Modality that introduces new genes into cancerous cells. So by hook or crook, you want your modified genes to get into the tumor cells. And are the surrounding tissues, either it goes into tumor cells or surrounding tissues. If it goes into the surrounding cells, then it will not allow the tumor cells to grow. And the surrounding cells will cover these tumor cells. Or you clip the genes in the tumor cells and proliferation avoided. So either way it is treated. Uh, and then a tissue to cause cell death or slow the growth of the cancer cells. Either external cells will reduce the growth of the cancer cells or cancer cells will die. And this treatment technique is very flexible and wide range of genes and vectors are being used in clinical trials with successful outcomes. So there are, but again I, I want to mention that, that this is all happening in the phase 4 patients. They are trying to find out and some people live longer. As I mentioned my friend's wife still surviving with pancreatic cancer. Her husband died in six months. She is surviving because of the immunotherapy she received. And again, now it's hard to explain. The husband dies, wife survives, live in the same house, eat the same food, same lifestyle, but the genes must be different. Because the husband gene came from his parent, wife gene came from her parents. They must be different. And this is where people are trying to understand this. So the treatment technique is very flexible, wide range of genes and vectors are used. There are two different types of genes therapy depending on which type of cells are treated. So somatic gene therapy, transfer of a section of DNA to any cell of the body that does not produce sperms or eggs or germline gene therapy, transfer of section of DNA to cells that produce eggs and sperms or you know this is the simple technique they are using for somatic gene therapy or germline gene therapy. So this is another uh, in vivo, ex vivo thing. So you use the transgene packaging, you know, you have a therapeutic gene, you put it into some system and then transfer it to the patient, IV or that is in vivo. Ex vivo is, you, this is the patient, you take his stem cells out, you treat the stem cells and get into cells 
and push as a trans therapeutic genes. That is how this whole thing therapeutic genes will be injected back to the system. And this is where the modifications happen in the cancer treatment in the system. Now only one genetic therapy is approved. That is called CAR T cell gene therapy for solid cancer. When there are solid tumors, <laughs> this chimeric antigen receptor CAR T cells are genetically engineered cells to express receptors for the recognition of a particular surface matter and these are promising for advanced blood disorders. So FDA has approved a form of gene therapy called CAR T cell therapy. It uses some sort of your own immune cells. They are called T cells. You know, you must have heard about COVID that when COVID, got, if the person got infected, if your T cells were strong enough, you survived the COVID. If you had not enough T cells, then you succumb to the COVID. And the T cells are part of your white blood corpuscles. They are present in WBC. That is your immuno uh, immunity. And higher the concentration of T cells, you had better immunity. And that's where they started hitting the patient, you know. So the same chimeric antigen receptor CAR T cells are genetically engineered cells to express receptors for the recognition of particular surface matter. So every tumor has a specific surface property. Every tumor from different body, it is different. So you have a different property for every solid tumor. And they are promising for advanced blood. So CAR T cell therapy is also explored to treat solid tumors such as ovarian, breast, prostate, renal, gastric, pancreatic, liver, colorectal and other solid tumors. So what you have is a, you, this is a human being which is suffering from cancer. So now you take the blood. From the blood you take the T cells, identify T cells and then the isolation and reprogramming of T cells. Now you remove the T cells and reprogram it with chimeric antigen receptors. So that becomes CAR T cell. And when that CAR T cell is created, then you, you allow it to multiply in, in, in vitro. And once they multiply, you get adequate concentration of CAR T cell, you put it in blood circulation. And these CAR T cells help this patient to fight the cancer. So this is the circulation. So you take the blood cell, separate out T cells, convert, ma manipulate it to, into chimeric uh, antigen receptor T cells and then multiply those and then create adequate amount of CAR T cells, inject and then it will be treated. And this is how this CAR T cell therapy is growing. And yeah. They, they, they say chimeric uh, antigen receptor is to functionalize the T cells so, yeah. so that it can find the cancer cell. Correct, right tumor cells where it will attack. That is, it's like antibody. Mm -hmm. You are activating your T cells to have a specific target to it. We have T cells, but when you convert it into chimeric antigen receptor T cell, which means now it is focused on a solid tumors, it will go in blood circulation, it will circulate. Now the blood also goes to solid tumors. When it comes to the solid tumor, this time a CAR T cell will destroy the cancer. Yeah, it is amazing. So we have a very nice, uh, if you are interested to see that, we have a article which is CAR T cell solid tumor challenges and opportunities. I am one of the authors there. It was published in stem cell and therapy. It is. A nice article which gives a lot of information about how these cartels. Uh, so now is precision medicine sustainable? So you will find that in the past the doctors used to have intuition. They used to see hundreds of patients. So looking at the patient they will say oh you are suffering from this. And then they will look at the signs and symptoms. And they will say that okay take this medicine and it used to work. In 90% of the patient. So that was our past tradition. Second, now in last 30-40 years what people are talking is that show me the evidence if it works or not. So that is called evidence-based medicine. So 
as we are growing in the medicine area we are finding that people ask questions is it going to work or not do you what are the, what are the data what is the data to prove that it works and from intuition medicine we move to evidence based medicine and now in because of the evidence based medicine the fda started asking you to show clinical trials show us that it works in healthy patients it works in patients and healthy people so that clinical trials became major thing for new drug development and that is practical application so therapeutic effectiveness in early days like in 40s and 50s people used to look at the person if there is oh yellow eye is suffering from joint in give the medicine for joint but now you have to find out what biomarker is there what is the reason how what is the evidence that this medicine will work are there clinical trials to prove that it works so we started moving from more and more scientifically proving the effectiveness of the medicine and now the future is precision medicine and this is where you will create a algorithms which will provide us means you will create the data from people and then you will find identify those brown people which are useful red people you will not use that and you will use this technology and that is why bioinformatics and artificial intelligence will be very helpful tool to create precision medicine because you have billions of patient data out of which if you analyze interpret that data you will find that only 100000 people were beneficial 900000 people did not show the benefit out of the therapy so obviously now you are concentrating on those 100000 then 100000 again you analyze the data and you find out that 100000 they were having different receptor technology or reasons then you come down to 10000 people and then your therapy will be only for 10000 people out of billion people that is called precision medicine and it will all come which will be very cost effective rather than giving the same medicine to million people if you give it to only 10000 people and get him relieved it is cost effective and money wise healthcare cost will go down with the precision medicine so there are some examples of recent developments in precision medicine i just want to share because these are all recent things happening like this is published in august 25 2022 patient derived tumor organoids demonstrate microbial influence on immune functions so what they did was immune checkpoint blockade is form of immunotherapy showing promising results in the fight against cancer and specifically in battling aggressive and often fatal metastatic triple negative breast cancer and in this case however with the clinical response rate of only 40% the treatment is not as universal as oncologist hope so even though immunotherapy is useful but it was useful only in 40% of the patient who are suffering from fatal metastatic triple negative breast cancer now you know this is another classification of the great cancer because it is some specific reason must be there for that of course a patient reaction to any treatment is contingent upon their disease type medical history genetic makeup lifestyle so why it is only 40% because 40% people had common genetic makeup common lifestyle common medical history that's why they responded 60% had different genetic type different environment different lifestyle so they did not respond now it will help us to understand what 60% people's genetic lifestyle was and then modify the precision medicine and to find between uh, link between microbiomes and immune response researchers from the wake forest institute of regenerative medicine and wake forest organoid research developed an innovative immune enhanced tumor organoid to study microbial metabolites and their effects on immunotherapy now what is happening is that whatever you eat is digested with the help of microbiome now when the microbiome digests your food they create two types of thing one is nutrients and other is toxic materials now if the microbiomes are creating more toxic material in your body then your body is susceptible for the diseases now you have different types of microbiomes in body some are good some are not so good and some are bad now what kind of bad microbiome you are carrying in your body will decide in coming 5 years what kind of disease you will have and this is where if you are eating if you are eating habits are encouraging the growth of bad 
to a microbiome obviously you are in trouble like people are now just saying that you can eat micro mcdonald stuff <laughs> once in a week but if you eat every day you may have problems with your microbiome because your microbiome or the microbiota the stomach uh, micro which are present mm -hmm. if you feed them with diverse food you need to have diverse food a balanced diet then you will have more good microbiomes and less bad microbiome if you feed yourself with a high you know fried food and lot of thing which help to grow bad microbiome you will find it so nowadays what people are doing and lot of researchers are going on is to analyze the fecal matter of human beings to find out if they have high concentration of bad microbes or low concentration of bad microbes if you have high bad microbe concentration high bad microbe concentration in your fecal matter automatically you are susceptible to that diseases and in 5 years you will start suffering from diseases and this is now becoming a very mainstream thought process now in our university also we have a very big microbiome center now for research it has happened in last 5 years only because they have now realized that the prevention is better than cure and if you can educate people and if you can nowadays in america you get mcdonald's burgers they are putting a lot of vegetables in it a lot of fibers in it putting lettuce this, right. that and all the thing because they are realizing that if you do not put all that on keep only meat your bad microbe grow if you put fiber vegetables and all the thing your good microbe grow and this is where the world is moving towards to understand the re reasons of the disease and how to treat them this is one of the very interesting reason they are trying so there is a fluorescence fluorescence quench substrate major parkinson disease related in the now parkinson disease is very common millions of people suffer from parkinson disease they don't have any medicine for that now they are trying to identify that what enzymes are causing parkinson disease what is it that your microbiota when it digest it builds up certain enzymes in the body if those enzymes go down people suffer from parkinson's over the period of time and they are trying to identify what enzymes are causing parkinson because they now studied and understood because there is now lot of data available so based on the data they are understanding that certain enzymes in body causes parkinson so can we treat that enzymes and can we reduce the concentration of those enzymes and this is where they are trying to find out the substrates of mm -hmm. parkinson's enzymes so that they can treat and that is uh, another very precision medicine is there where they are using fluorescence quench substrates then self boosting vaccines are near at hand that is august 2022 so researchers from mit massachusetts institute of technology have been working on self boosting vaccine for a decade now and motivated by the crisis under immunized children in some of the poorer countries of the world with no healthcare infrastructure and because of the covid-19 pandemic curiosity about underlying platform has spiked the first world nation where vaccination boosters now have personal everyday relevance now what is happening is that we in in case of covid we had first dose second dose and then booster dose correct now people are understanding that you provided a polio vaccine to the children but for the period of time certain children again suffered from polio so now they are trying to understand why it has happened what must be the reason why the vaccine did not work because in certain children it worked very well it certainly did not work so is there is a need for booster vaccine and this is where now they are trying to find out uh, self boosting vaccines so you create something which you inject again and that will create a antibodies within your body to continue protecting your body so this is where the self boosting vaccine become precision medicine and that is uh, people are working on this and for covid it has worked so obviously uh, they will build up different boosters for all vaccines so that children will not suffer from the yeah especially it is in tb vaccine tuberculosis vaccine they have seen that in tb vaccine people suffer from tb and tb bacteria remain in your body forever like i am from india 
So if you if I give the exam uh, test for TB bacteria, they will find it. But my immunity is stronger, so I never had TB. So this is how they are trying to identify what causes the strong immunity mm -hmm. and why the people suffer even after TB vaccine. And this is where their booster uh, system, they are working on it. In Alzheimer's research, are we missing the boat? So researchers in Alzheimer's in the supermarket uh, tanker uh, of work focused on handful of pathologies. Now we are trying to understand why Alzheimer's happened. So people are now, when they, after the death, if the patient allow, then they do the autopsy and they identify, take the different portions of brain to find out what is happening in Alzheimer's patient. And now they are finding out that there are amyloid proteins which start growing into the body and then you start forgetting. And how to reduce the amyloid proteins in the brain so that you will have better memory. And this is where uh, people are working on vaccines for Alzheimer's to find out how to reduce the amyloid protein concentrations and they are trying to find out but they are saying that have we missed the boat because people are growing and a lot of people are suffering from Alzheimer's so it's a very big area neurological epidemic actually in America they call it because good number of people from 60 onwards suffer from Alzheimer's and it is challenging and they are trying to find out the so metallobomics is bolomics is crucial to personalizing lung cancer therapy now you must have heard about uh, proteomics, metallomics, all these things have come out of genomics. And now people are understanding the role of proteins in the body and how they cause the diseases and how you can, like we talked about curcumin, if you remember, NLRA3 is the inflammasome, which is a protein. And it is high concentration, you get a lot of anti-inflammatory diseases. And then I talked about resolvin, which is a body fighting protein. You raise the resolvent concentration in body, you can treat the disease. Body itself can disease. So now people are trying to understand really what is the protein role, how it is happening. And then there are another area which is uh, metabolomics, which is, is it the actual chemical or its metabolites are causing diseases? And I had a, I, I must have shared you that I work in industry and we used to work on a new drug and then after three years, we found out that the metabolites were 500 times stronger active than the new drug itself. They were worried about it. It's not it's dangerous to put this thing. So, metabolomics is crucial in personalizing lung cancer therapy and they try to understand how this metabolomics will help in treating the lung cancers to create precision medicine for them. Then you come to long COVID and chronic fatigue syndrome uh, has a lot in common. So evidence is emerging that long COVID, formerly post-acute sequelae SARS-CoV-2 infection that was called, bears a striking molecular level resemblance to the disabling and complex illness not known as myalgic encephalomyelitis or chronic fatigue syndrome. Now, if I don't know you have seen any patients with uh, long-term COVID. It is so tough for them because they are always 24 by 7 fatigue. They don't have energy to do anything. They suffer from myocarditis, their heart sac becomes inflamed and accumulates water. As soon as it accumulates water, the pumping of the heart doesn't work. And then it accumulates more liquid into the lungs. And then lungs create problem in liver. And then this is the challenges that are happening with the long-term COVID patient. So they, there are many young people in America who are in hospital for more than one year suffering from long-term COVID. They are many in number, especially in the age group of 30 to 45. They don't understand why only this age group is suffering from long-term COVID. Not the older people, they died. But uh, in between, they suffered from COVID and survived. But nowadays, gradually people are realizing the impact of long-term COVID. Because even though you are COVID-free, your body still carries the virus. And it affects some part of your body and that is where they are trying to understand what is the common and how to learn more about from the precision point of view. Then classification system of colorectal cancer needs an update. So they are learning more and more about colorectal cancer and how to create a multinational team is working on consensus molecular subtype classification of colorectal cancer and 
they are trying to pick up the cells and trying to identify how to modify it so that they can create a precision medicine for a particular uh, consensus molecules of, you know, for a particular colorectal cancer and they are working on this. It is published in Nature Genetics recently in 2022. Uh, there is an online big clustering tool certified patient to the molecular level. Now people are trying to understand exactly on the molecular level how it is happening and I am going to talk about this different levels of it in our cancer treatment. You know, there is a talk on this and I will explain you okay. how there is a network of networks in the next class so uh, there is a g4 ga4 g8 pheno packet standard published by iso now international organization has, has published a pheno packet standard initially developed by global alliance of genomics and health championed by iso under canadian mirror committee and they are providing we finally they have a they are now creating standardized genomics to do more research in this area and identify how they can be utilized for different types of precision medicine. Then Houteng Pharma supplies SGLT2 inhibitors against type 2 diabetes. So metformin is classic. Even today metformin works for diabetes. It is a classic hypoglycemic drug patient which is used for 40 plus years. It is in market still. And essential drug combination regimens, however, as evidence is updated, concept of drug choice for first line treatment is changing and patients with type 2 diabetes who have atherosclerotic cardiovascular diseases. Now, diabetes, you suffer from diabetes and after 10 years or 15 years, you start showing different types of side effects. Those are side effects of diabetes. So you have atherosclerosis, you have diabetic retinopathy, you have kidney function disturbed. So, diabetes causes many different side effects in body over the period of time. If you do not control and monitor your sugar, if you have a continuous 400 sugar, definitely you will start leading toward blindness. And that is where the people are trying to understand what is the way to treat and prevent the side effects of the diabetes. And they are trying to for cardiorenal benefits of new hypoglycemic drugs in clinical trial translated into practical applications. So if person is suffering from clinical uh, renal, cardiorenal challenges with diabetes, then they are trying to find out a precision medicine for these patients only not for the total diabetic, but only who have cardinal, cardiorenal benefit. So genetic testing helps improve outcomes in epilepsy. I have picked up, you know, if you remember my definition of chronic diseases and the prominent chronic diseases, I have picked up only those chronic diseases which are on a larger scale. So epilepsy is one of the chronic diseases for the older patients. And studying patients with epilepsy leads to the researches of medical genetics company in white show that 50% of the patient changed their treatment and 75% reported improved outcome of the result once they started using this precision medicine for things. And 40% of children and 23% of the adults which suffering from epilepsy have a genetic cause for their condition which can impact treatment choice but genetic testing is not currently widely carried out in the epileptic patient. Now they are trying to find out what gene is causing epilepsy in a particular patient and then start finding out the precision medicine for the epilepsy. So there is a causative effect of dopamine in schizophrenia. That is another uh, chronic disease and they are trying to find out how the dopamine can be useful in schizophrenia for the patients. Then there is a candle therapeutic which is a company uh, in collaboration with University of Pennsylvania found out a viral CAR T combo therapy treatment. We talked about CAR T cell treatment and they are trying to use virals viruses and CAR T cell combination as a viruses as a carrier to deliver CAR T cell for the treatment of cancer. Next question. Oh, go ahead. Uh, I'll try. <laughs> uh, she's asking why the people uh, consume drugs uh, develop that kind of uh, schizophrenia or mental yeah. disease. When they develop the, 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 the disease or the, the drug activated disease or, 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 or uh, exactly because of the exist on, on dopamine 
you know the epilepsy and schizophrenia are neural diseases if there is a up and down of dopamine in the brain then you show epilepsy or schizophrenic attacks now what people are trying to understand is that certain people they identified a gene causing epilepsy now what today what they are doing is they are giving common medicine to all of them what gene is causing epilepsy they haven't studied it so they give the medicine and they try to relieve from the medicine some people show very good therapeutic response to the medicines some people don't show it second thing is that in epilepsy over the period of time you start increasing the dose for epilepsy because if it is severe attacks one after the other it can cause death and that's why they increase the dose now does that really helpful or not we don't know but now that is the way of practice so what people are trying to identify is what particular gene is causing epilepsy in this person so they are trying to extract the blood find out the t cells find out the genes which are and trying to adopt genetic modification and this is where so rather than treating them with the same drug for a long term try to find out the actual basic reason for epilepsy and then treat it accordingly that, that's why you have to remember that figure with 100 patient some are green some are blue some are uh, brown some give different results so some of them only show toxicity so we have to identify that particular group which is getting right medicine for the right person and that is where they will try to identify and that's why gene therapy will be helpful to them because they will use their own blood their own genes and then they will treat them sound good so we have already seen this car t combo therapy development so they are using viral uh, vectors to treat it then vaccine we exist stealth mode to advance cancer immunotherapy there are a lot of researches are going on immunotherapies for cancer treatment uh, in the precision medicine so genomic analysis can track and help anthelmintic drug resistance you know there are anthelmintics are very problematic in tropical countries and they are trying to track it why why would the genes not everybody suffers so what genes are really responsible for that type of treatment so they have they are creating diagnostics to understand what is really a good way of finding out the genes and this is they are helping the pharma partners to find out some sort of uh, companion diagnostics and get it you will get the whole powerpoint presentation lady he will give you the powerpoint presentation so now researchers are also trying to uncover neurons from ptsd patients react differently so you have a post trauma you know people who suffer from army in wars they have post traumatic experiences and this post traumatic react differently normal human being reacts to a particular drug and a ptsd person react differently now people are trying to understand how it happens because like i i told you i had a student who was witness to the mass shooting in the university mm-hmm. so for 3 years she suffered very badly lot of steroids lot of things and she couldn't do it because she was and she was not responding to the drugs but now she is very healthy she finished phd with me so Uh, PTSD people who are post traumatic stress disorder respond to the medicines differently because their body has changed there is lot of changes which happen suppose you see somebody killing in front of you then you have a trauma and that trauma creates stress in your body the stress creates lot of hormones <laughs> relieved from the body and then those imbalance is created in the body that imbalance is reflected in non responsive therapy there and this is where people are trying to study what is the reason why this is happening and what must be the, because there must be some genes who are causing that and people are exploring that high blood pressure in womb increases offspring mortality risk this is what i was talking about mm-hmm. that if you have high blood pressure during pregnancy then it offspring mortality risk is very high there Uh, discover the protein role in cancer cachexia so proteomic uh, pharmacoproteomic that is where they are trying to understand the role of proteins how and then you know most of the reasons uh, you will find are ros this uh, 
reactive oxygen species and protein they go hand in hand proteins can raise or reduce the concentration of ROS the more higher concentration of ROS you see all sorts of diseases in the body and products like turmeric or glutathione reduce the ROS because they are antioxidants so most of the natural antioxidants if you take if you eat more tomatoes you know every day if you take one or two tomatoes it contains lycopene lycopene is antibiotic antioxidant so it reduces the ROS in the body so there are ways to help yourself to control this through the diet also and that's what people are trying to learn so chest imaging can improve outcomes of CRC patients with lung metastasis and there are you know these are trying people are trying to do that nucleome attract big pharma investment for genetic dark matter so nanoparticle plus mRNA is the basis for universal COVID-19 treatment that is what they have done and it is used so North America precision market is will be surpassing almost 50 billion by 2027 and there are many companies who are actively involved in precision medicine now you can see the big names of La Roche, Biometrics, Eli Lilly, AstraZeneca, Glasgow, Smith Klein and new drugs and diagnostic tests are coming up using this precision medicine understanding the genetic structures and this is how the market will look like in 2020 it is only 3.3 billion by uh, 2020 it will be 10 billion and it will go to 50 billion in 2027 so strong demand is for cancer treatment lot of money is invested into using immunotherapy for cancer treatment and cns applications alzheimer's parkinson's these diseases take a lot of money from the healthcare so people are putting a lot of uh, money into this treatment. Uh, Europe precision market is also growing. There are many companies which are working in Asia Pacific precision market, medicine market is also going because Japan, India, China, all of these companies, Korea is putting a lot of money into the precision mating. Now you will ask me why I said back to square one. If you remember my first slide was saying back to square one. The reason I am saying is that traditional Chinese medicine has been a personalized medicine. Ayurveda has been a personalized medicine. Homeopathy has been a personalized medicine. In, I have studied homeopathy a lot. So in homeopathy, there are 52 different medicines just for headache. The headache, they will ask you 100 questions. How much water you drink? How many times a day you feel thirsty? What kind of side? This side or this side or this side or that side? And these questions will help them to find out a right medicine for your headache or for your disease. And this is a very personalized medicine. This approach is personalized medicine. It was practiced by traditional Chinese medicine, Ayurveda and homeopathy. Now Western medicine is learning a lot of things about personalized medicine. And they are bringing modern science together with evidence based. And a day will come that it will match or it will merge and they, people will understand more and more about and they will now understand a day will come people will understand how the dilution in homeopathy improves the therapy which is against the modern medicine thought process but it works that is where people will so these are my books in this area and oh, muchas gracias so I finished it in time have uh, any um, question uh, with me? Yeah. Are you English? I know you can. <laughs> if you have questions, and do you mind if I... Go, 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 go on. Because I told you, Jardin yeah, is yeah. My, <laughs> my medicine has made me to go to restroom <laughs> and go. come back in two minutes. While I'm and While you need the, the microphone, yeah. so people... Okay, don't go. worry, don't worry about it. The restroom yeah. is available on the... Yeah, yeah. yeah. I hope so. porque el incremento de dopamina produce, digamos, o puede incrementar en enfermedades como la epilepsia. Es que la dopamina es un neurotransmisor, pero el neurotransmisor, los que saben, la dopamina incrementa pues, la sensación de felicidad y todo. Eso está modificado en el gen debido a que hay una, hay una hormona llamada norepinefrina. La norepinefrina es la que actúa sobre la ira, la, eh, el deseo sexual, toda esa parte. Y cuando, la, la, cuando la, digamos, algunas personas tienen ese gen eh, por la síntesis de, 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 de proteínas, tienen el gen 
modificado, mutado, en lugar de dar esas sensaciones, empieza a dar temblores, los sisos. Entonces, eso es lo que pasa con la, con la epilepsia, y no solamente con la epilepsia, sino cuando hay una modificación genética que no es propia de nosotros, sino la mutación cuando nacemos o, o, o de pronto, no, es más que todo en mutación, es por eso que los incrementos de dopamina es de, incrementarán el, el índice de temblores, de ataques, eso es lo que sucede con ese tipo de cosas, más porque la dopamina es eh, lo que tú mencionabas de las drogas, sí, las drogas incrementan las drogas, eh, la, 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 la dopamina tiene una, una camina y las drogas son alcaloides, Entonces, las, eh, cualquier droga, ya sea cocaína, heroína, aumenta el nivel de, de sí, lo aumenta porque lo va, lo va a activar, de la estimula. Entonces, al, al aumentarlo, pues lógicamente los ataques pueden incrementar. Entonces, por eso los pacientes con esquizofrenia o con epilepsia tienen que tener medicamentos que reduzcan el que les mía, o si no sería, o si no aumentaría la cantidad de ataques. O sea, después de un cierto nivel de incremento de dopamina, ya no es el tema de la felicidad, de su comunidad, eso, sino que empieza la persona a generar temblores. Sí, pero eso es en, en, en personas, como decía el doctor, en personas que tienen mutador G. Porque la, si no todos tendríamos temblores, digamos, hay personas, eh, ese se llama el, el fenómeno Wall Street. Tenemos los Wall Street, es que la mayoría de los de los de los, eh, los de banca, la, la mayoría de los agentes, se me olvidan, los corredores, los corredores de bolsa, consumen mucho cocaína. Esos son los que mejor, pues, es una clase son los que consumen cocaína 99. Y los lo, lo que tienen la plata para consumir cocaína 99. Porque están en tan nivel de presión. Y entonces para relajarte necesitan lógicamente eh, eh, que, la, que el neurotransmisor se active, dopamina. Pero antes de eso, la hormona es la que permite, la norepinefrina es la que permite precisamente primero que haya una, un, un sentido de esas y deseos sexual y después que haya una cadera, porque la, que, lógicamente se consume. Pero eh, eso, es, eh, eso no les permite, no van a tener eso, pero los que tienen el hecho, los que tienen el tema de que no, que nunca se lo han tratado, ahí sí es un problema. Hey, so any question for me? Interesting discussion about the dopamine. So thank there you. are more questions in the chat, so you can you can try the questions. And the microphones are open. Se oh, pueden, that's good. Pueden hacer también preguntas verbalmente. Está abierto los micrófonos. So the question is: Has any attempt been made to extract the cancer vaccine from the blood plasma of people who have fully recovered from it? So they are trying about that. There are a lot of researchers which are going on creating a cancer vaccine. And I hope another four or five years you will find some vaccine which can create or prevent the cancer. But today nothing is available. But research is going on in that area. What plants used in medicine can prevent cancer and neurodegenerative diseases? What plants can protect the brain and improve its performance? Now, this is another challenge because there are many plants, like I mentioned in my first class about application of nutraceuticals in chronic diseases. Cancer and brain diseases are chronic diseases. And we have seen that turmeric uh, is very useful. People are using turmeric, uh, curcuma here they call, for this thing, glutathione, lipoic acid, lot of natural uh, antioxidants are complementing the therapy. They are not the sole therapy, but they are complementing the therapy for neurodegenerative diseases as well as cancer. So there is a, uh, and I have shown uh, in my previous talk, several US patents have been offered or given to a combination therapy of herbal drugs and the anti-cancer drug or for Alzheimer's disease, they are trying to find out how they can reduce the ROS concentration so that the plaque formation within the brain, amyloid plaque formation can be reduced. And that is where the research is going on. So I answered both the questions. There are two, correct? Okay. Don't worry of your for your Spanish. Thank you so much to <laughs> come to Colombia. Oh <laughs> okay, okay. That, thank you. Okay. Muchas gracias for that comment. Any other question? Any other question? Yeah. Go ahead. I have a question about um, when you say that the fast food, uh, I understand that 
if I eat fast food, this fast food, for example, McDonald's, can create a mutation in my cells, yeah. my DNA? Quite possible. Why? Because, you know, what is happening is the kind of methods and processes they are using are not healthy. Like, they are finding out that those people who were continuously eating processed food from the cans are having challenges. Those who are eating, eating fresh fruits, fresh vegetables, fresh uh, grains, they are healthier. The reason is when you use processed food, you add uh, preservatives, you add antibacterials, you add chemicals to retain the property for a longer time. Mm -hmm. So those preservatives cause problems. Now some of the preservatives have antibacterial activity. So when you eat the processed food, you are eating antibacterial material which destroys your microbiota. Mm -hmm. And that's why using processed food affects the microbiota. If you use natural food, there are no preservative. Like nowadays you come with organic vegetables. Why organic vegetables? Because there are no insecticides, no fertilizers. So organic will have good uh, food for your microbiota, for your microbiota. And if you use insecticide and fertilizer, they will kill your microbiota. Very simple. The yogurt will raise amount of microbiota. The yogurt without culture will not, it's a simple yogurt, no bacteria. It will not help the growth of bacteria. The growth of bacteria and most of the bacteria in body are anaerobic. So they grow on, yeah. So you need, what people say that to prevent cancer, you should eat high fiber diet. Then if you want to prevent colorectal cancer, you should eat turmeric regularly. In India, people, very few people, percentage of colorectal cancer in India is less because we eat turmeric curcuma every day in our food. Yeah. In our food, it is a spice. So, most of the spices, cardamom, curcuma, ajo wine, phenyl, spices, spices, they are all antioxidant. They are all good for your body. So, yeah, even hot pepper, habanero, good for your body. But you should not eat big. Small quantity, small quantity of these every day will prevent diseases because they are antioxidant in nature. They reduce the reactive oxygen species in the body. Make sense? Yeah. So, yeah. so processed food no good. Fried food no good. The modi genetically modified food GMO? No good. Because when you modify genetically, you are changing the structure of the herb or food. And it is after, so that those genes are changing your body also. That is epigenetics. So a lot of studies are going on on epigenetics. How the things can change your genes. And that is important. Okay. What about, uh, I'm thinking about the the prices and how popular is this kind of uh, genetic treatment in the United States? You know, nowadays there is always a tug of war. So the people who are money, they want more money. And that's why they will keep on improving the taste, cheating, don't tell you the truth. That will happen. But there are other people like I, when I first went to America in 1988, they did not know what is vegetarian. 
if you go to the rural area they never understood what is vegetarian nowadays every big restaurant has a salad bar even i i was in crepe and waffles yeah crepe and waffles they have a big salad bar and i was very happy because they had more than 20 vegetarian dishes and good healthy dishes so obviously like i stay in hotel boutique so i told them professor caesar told them i am vegetarian so every day they make different vegetarian dishes now the chief chef came and thanked me that because of me he is experimenting with new dishes and yesterday the owner came and told me that we might have a different menu of vegetarian food <laughs> that is a good thing so you have to understand that you have to change the lifestyle and changing the lifestyle can help you in yeah. going away from the diseases or reducing the diseases i was talking about the the genetic treatment the for for the disease uh, the personalized uh, yeah medicine so i guess it is uh, expensive would i yes and how popular uh, is the that kind of treatment in the united states in united states it is very popular because lot of people are getting it their insurance covers because the insurance covers they are going for it but insurance doesn't cover certain treatment like for my knees there is a stem cell treatment which mm-hmm. cost around 36000 dollars but insurance doesn't cover that if they would have covered that i don't need me operation but still there is a you know it is all political okay. thank you very much any oh. question no so please gracias muchas professor again muchas gracias thank you very much i hope you enjoyed Bueno, muchas gracias a todos los que nos acompañaron, especialmente los que están aquí y por supuesto también a quienes están en, en línea. Nos vemos mañana. Una feliz, uh, una foto, <ríe> una feliz tarde. Um, can you visit the university, the, in the labs? No. In the hospital?